Nowadays, it's incredibly difficult to stay focused while studying, especially since social media has us connected at all times, and that one friend is always bragging about having too much fun. Meanwhile, here I am, locked in the cave, blasting my eyes with radio waves, learning how to treat constipation. Uh, for a friend though. So it's no surprise that more than 89% of the population is regularly drugged up on psychoactive stimulants. I'm talking about caffeine. Coffee and tea are two of the most highly consumed drinks in the world, and as such, they've been heavily studied over the years. It's safe to say at this point that coffee and tea can be great additions to our diet, but just knowing they're quote-unquote good for you doesn't give us students any idea about how to incorporate them into our lives for full focus and benefit. How should we drink them? When should we drink them? How much? And of course, the age-old question, which one is better, coffee or tea? Okay, first let's start off with some similarities. How should we drink coffee and tea? Well, the answer is the same for both, plain and in moderation. I know that we all love our whole milk, double espresso, caramel, vanilla frappuccinos with whipped cream and extra sour gummies and diabetes, but it's best to keep all that nonsense away. Because at that point, it's a calorie and sugar overload. It's like putting pineapple on pizza. Sure, you're getting some fruit, but that doesn't excuse the fact that you're eating a freaking pizza. Very high sugar spikes are counterproductive for work and study because it causes a spike in insulin, which can lead to food comas and crashes, and that defeats the whole purpose of caffeine. By the way, check out this video here where I actually measured my blood levels to show you those sugar crashes in full detail. So unsweetened tea and just plain black coffee contain all the goodies that we want, the caffeine, the antioxidants, and they do so without the calories. That's right, for those of you who do intermittent fasting in the morning, drinking a plain coffee or tea won't break your fast. It might even help curb your hunger by activating hormones in the stomach that make us feel full. Just remember to limit your caffeine intake to the safe level of less than 400 milligrams a day. So the next question is, when should we get our caffeine fix? I hear a lot of people say they drink coffee first thing in the morning. I also know a friend who sets their coffee maker to go off right when he wakes up so that he can just get the caffeine into his body as soon as possible. Well, according to science, this is not the most productive way to use caffeine, and it has to do with our circadian rhythm. Our body's internal clock that manages our rhythm does this through various chemicals. So in the morning, our adrenal glands release cortisol, which helps to wake us up. And then slowly throughout the day, cortisol drops. In response, our pineal gland releases melatonin at night, which makes us feel sleepy and slowly throughout the night, this drops. So think of these two chemicals as opposites of each other. Cortisol keeps us up and then melatonin knocks us out. And this makes sense because they're elevated at different times throughout the day. So first let's focus on cortisol. Based on what we know, cortisol levels naturally peak at about one to two hours after we wake up. On the other hand, caffeine has a side effect of artificially boosting cortisol levels in our body. So what this means is that if you drink caffeine within an hour or so of waking up, you're actually interfering with your body's natural ability to wake up. Basically, your body is already high on cortisol, so why do you need to waste that caffeine and add more cortisol to the mix? A better approach would be to wait until your cortisol level peaks before drinking caffeine. And remember, this is about one to two hours after we wake up. So what I do is I brew my coffee into a heat trapping thermos so that I can enjoy it after I get to the hospital or midway through my 9 a.m. lecture. This way, as cortisol begins to drop, we can get a second wave of energy, a boost to stay focused and alert for longer without interfering with our bodies. So that was when you should use caffeine. Now, when should you not use caffeine? Well, here on this channel, we always talk about how the most productive thing you can do for your grades is to get enough quality sleep. Well, misusing caffeine is the enemy of quality sleep. And depending on how sensitive you are to caffeine, it's recommended not to have caffeine after 3 p.m. if we want to sleep on time. So I know for me, if I drink caffeine after 4 p.m., I usually have a really hard time sleeping. And I know that Maddie is super sensitive to caffeine, so he usually calls it quits by around noontime. But that's something that you'll have to experiment with on your own to find your sweet spot where you can focus during the day and still pass out by bedtime. So those are just a couple points to consider for both coffee and tea. But now let's get more specific about each one. And we're not going to talk much about their health benefits, but rather their strengths for focus and how to brew them and use them for a daily productive workflow. Let's start with practicality and brewing. An 8 ounce cup of coffee has about 100 milligrams of caffeine, 
which means that throughout your day, four eight ounce cups of coffee should be the upper, upper limit. Honestly, make it three, since a lot of us eat other caffeine rich foods like chocolates, sodas and stuff, so give yourself a buffer. Plus, some coffee has a lot more caffeine than others. If you're Vietnamese like me, you know what I'm talking about. But of course, that's assuming it's brewed the same way every time. You're not trying to invent the next all-nighter solution. And as a student, I know how time-consuming and tedious it can be to brew a decent cup of coffee every morning. Especially when I snooze four times before remembering there's a required pop quiz at 8 a.m. But there's a fantastic solution to this problem, which is why I want to thank Cometeer for partnering with us for this video. Cometeer isn't like other coffee. It's barista quality coffee brewed better through science. And you all know how much we love to nerd out over science. Cometeer partners with the best regional roasters where coffee is brewed to perfection and then flash frozen to seal that freshness into these tiny capsules. All I have to do is empty the capsule into my container of choice, heat up some water, and boom, a delicious cup of specialty joe ready to go in a moment's notice. Or mix it with water or milk for an iced coffee or latte. And all the packaging and capsules can be recycled. Yeah, that's right. I care about the planet. As a former hippie barista, I gotta say this coffee is delicious. I can actually taste the different flavors and it's super convenient. No more grinding beans, no more washing your gadgets, no more wasting time swinging by the coffee shop on the way to class, dropping fat stacks, tipping extra for the holiday seasons. With Cometeer, you can have consistently great coffee every day without even needing to put on pants. And for a limited time, you can get $20 off your first purchase plus free shipping if you use our special link in the description below. That's 10 free cups of coffee and over 30% off. Tea is a bit more complex. The caffeine content in tea varies depending on the type of tea. A cup of black tea has roughly 50 milligrams, whereas green tea has about 25 milligrams. But just like with coffee, unless you brew and steep your tea properly, you might not be getting all the nutrients from tea. For example, if you're like Mike and like to steep several tea bags for hours while you sip on it, it'll probably have a little more caffeine and taste like crushed up Tylenol. Dude, what is happening here? It's like my tea strong, you know? For black tea, a four to five minute steep should be sufficient. And for green tea, two to three minutes is gold. But if you like it bitter, hey, you do you. It also matters how hot the water is. Water above 200 degrees Fahrenheit can actually destroy some of the beneficial nutrients in tea. So steeping tea around 175 to 180 degrees is what I do. So if you want the perfect cup of tea that tastes delicious and retains all the nutrients, it might require a bit more of your attention than brewing a cup of coffee. But on the plus side, it's pretty unlikely that you'll reach the caffeine limit purely with tea, even if you extra steep it. I don't know a lot of people who can drink 16 cups of cream tea a day. Next, let's talk about focus. Of the two, coffee will provide a much more potent buzz than tea, which of course makes sense since there's two to three times more caffeine in coffee than tea. But this also means that the likelihood of caffeine crash is much higher. Caffeine works by blocking adenosine receptors in our brain. So when adenosine builds up in these areas, we get sleepy. So basically, caffeine blocks our body from getting sleepy. The problem is caffeine works kind of like a dam. So you can imagine that all this adenosine will just build up behind the blockage. And when caffeine leaves the body, all the built up adenosine will just come flooding in and make you super sleepy. That's the caffeine crash. So knowing this, we can make a distinction between the two. Coffee can get us feeling incredibly amped and energized, but for a shorter duration of deep work because it generally has more caffeine. On the other hand, tea generally has less caffeine and won't be as clutch to help us wake up, but it can give us a steadier and calmer buzz without as much fear for a caffeine crash. So as a student, those are the main points to consider when thinking about coffee versus tea. And as you can see, the right one for you might change based on what you're doing. It all depends on the kind of work or studying that needs to be accomplished that day. Maybe even a combination of both coffee and tea. For example, when I was preparing for a step two exam, I would drink a cup of coffee in the morning for a laser focused four hours of practice problems. Then I'd immediately go to the gym, use the remaining caffeine as a pre-workout, have lunch, and tackle the afternoon with a cup of green tea, since it was more chill work, like watching videos, doing flashcards, or light reading. What I'm trying to say is, I don't necessarily think about one being better than the other, 
but I think of them as serving different purposes, depending on the peak and duration of focus I need for that day. Plus, coffee and tea have amazing health benefits. There's data to suggest both coffee and tea are loaded with antioxidants and nutrients, which can lower our risk for cancer, lower blood pressure, and increase our immune response. And the icing on the cake is that they both make me poop pretty instantly, so it's a great way to keep regular on the bowel movements. And to wrap up this video, I think it's important to note that we all respond to caffeine differently. Remember that caffeine is a drug, meaning we can build up a tolerance and dependence on it, and that we all digest it differently. Caffeine gets metabolized by very specific enzymes in our liver. Some people have more of this enzyme, some people have less of this enzyme, and some people's enzymes work better than others. My point here is that you need to figure out how sensitive you are to caffeine. What kind of metabolizer are you? Does one cup of coffee get you bouncing off the walls all day? Or does it wear off quickly and you fall asleep in the hour? Just this idea alone could be the sole difference in whether coffee or tea is more right for you. So caffeine is just one way that we use to get ourselves focused and more energized for studying and working. If you wanna know about how diet might affect that too, then definitely check out this video right here.